demonstrating it. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your training then at the Montessori school. Well, yeah. that was quite interesting because we started really as 16-year-olds in running the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we were not very good at it, but the food that was available wasn't very good either. So we could manage pretty <laughs> well to cook potatoes and cook flake, uh, quick oats and this sort of thing. Um, but the one thing that was built in into this work in the mm -hmm. kitchen was to have the children along in a perfectly well-organized corner for kitchen work for, ch for young children. Mm -hmm. A low sink that really worked, a low table with blunted knives where they could cut. Mm -hmm. After two years of that, I had a chance of a semester of study in Holland, oh, yes. which uh, was just at the end of a course Dr. Montessori had given there, but time enough to visit the schools, which at that time were the best schools in Europe, mm -hmm. because Holland, not having been part of the war, was very help was developed very well that way. <clears throat> I think that's when my interest in the older children began as I eventually started out to be the elementary school teacher mm -hmm. in the Montessori method mm -hmm. and in Vienna. <clears throat> and that again was helped by the persistence of my mother that if I chose this career, I should at least have a decent degree. So I, got, I went to the teacher's college for one semester and came out with my degree <laughs> as an elementary <laughs> and kindergarten teacher, which it just was a basis, but yes. not really added yes. very much yeah. to my knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> but what really added to my knowledge were two summers I could spend at a biological station of the University of Vienna mm -hmm. in, at a lake in the Alps, oh. which studied the ecology of water, mm -hmm. both of the lake and of the contributories of the lake, where mm -hmm. we would go into the mountains. And this combination of work with the microscope was meant to really sharpen our perception and observation. Yes. And it certainly did a lot for me. Yes. You stayed at the Montessori School in Vienna until about 1938. Yes. And that was pre-World War II. The tensions became very, very great. You tell us about this time. Well, you see, this time was not only pre-World War II, but for Austrians was the takeover of Austria by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. That means we became... we stopped being a country of our own mm -hmm. and became part of the German Reich, which at that time meant that all the prosecutions that had happened in Germany to not only Jewish people, but also those who looked at life uh, from the left mm -hmm. and disagreed with the Nazi doctrines on these reasons, yes. got persecuted and persecuted in a very frightening way. Yes. And we had a little taste of it taste enough to know that we better look to get out as mm -hmm. fast as we can. Mm -hmm. Well, our passports were gone. They, they searched our apartment and took the passports. So in order to get the passports back, we, Robert had to dissolve his office. His law uh, practice. Yes, yes, I mean, he, he had just started to have yes. his own shingle out. Yes. And uh, really, he dissolved the practice of, of his friend with whom he um, shared the practice who was not Jewish, mm -hmm. but who was a correspondent for some English papers and so couldn't, couldn't do that anymore mm -hmm. from Vienna, but went to Prague and then finally to London. And in order to, to get our passports back, he, he submitted the whole office to a Nazi attorney and at least after three months we had our passports. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds easy to leave. You just go on the train and leave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't all that easy because <clears throat> between the train and getting off the train were several frontiers and you had to have documents to mm -hmm. cross the frontiers. Mm -hmm. Looking back now, uh, nobody was very friendly. Mm -hmm. The Swiss let get you through, but they didn't let you stay. The French were already very uneasy in 38 and one knew it wouldn't make sense to try to settle in France. The English let you in if you had a letter of invitations which you got through our friend, but also only if you had hopes to leave England again, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which we did because yeah. we had already an affidavit of support which was needed to get into this country. Uh -huh. And uh, the Americans were uh, amazingly responsive to the needs of 
this group of sudden refugees who mm -hmm. had to get out. But of course, the uh, bureaucracy worked slowly, sure. and the quota numbers were set. Mm -hmm. So one had to wait until one's quota number came. So we, we had a very interesting experience of spending three months in London waiting for our quota number mm -hmm. so we could get to this country. And through these three months, and I mention that because this was the first thing that I think qualified me for work with sick children afterwards. We were in charge of a home for Basque children. Mm -hmm. may not mean anything to listeners today, but the Basque country was the first country bombed in, my, in the experience of people born after 1900. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the first uh, children bombed in the city of Bilbao, in the mm -hmm. Basque country, by the Franco yes. troops. A British warship picked up these children, brought them to England, and we were asked, that was already a year and a half before we came, to take over one of these homes of 36 people. Oh. And it was fascinating. Then you, you were on your way to the United States. Yes. Where did you go when you first came here? <laughs> well, of course, we landed in New York. Yes. And uh, we came directly from the Basque Children's Home mm -hmm. to a Dutch ship and landed in New York. I got already seasick while the ship wasn't, ship wasn't moving yet. <laughs> it was, it was a not easy departure yeah. from, New, from yeah. the old continent. Uh -huh. um, we landed in New York and our affidavit, that means the responsibility of somebody taking responsibility that we would not be a public burden until we were citizens. Mm -hmm. That means for the first five years of our American life, somebody had to assume responsibility yes. in case we couldn't mm -hmm. uh, support ourselves. And we had two sisters who I had, Robert hadn't met them, I had met uh, at some of their visits in Europe <coughs> when they came to see our school and were very intrigued by it. They attended Dr. Montessori's training course in 1913 in Rome. So you can oh. imagine uh, how far span. back that yes, goes. Yes. And, um, one of them had her PhD in psychology, the other one was a psychiatric social uh -huh. worker from Smith. Now the social worker lived in San Francisco, that's where they were from, and uh, the other sister lived in New York. And she said, as soon as we arrived, well, you, you better go on right to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. When you got to San Francisco, after a period of time, you became affiliated with the Presidio Hill School, is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. which was a small private school, very similar to the one we had in Vienna, uh -huh. different in its focus. It was a parent cooperative mm -hmm. and uh, ran through junior high. Mm -hmm. And I, I think started out with the fifth grade. And, um, but the, person, the important person at Presidio Hill was its director, Josephine yeah. Duvenek. Yes. I just remember when I got my citizenship, Robert was in the service then, she gave me a book by Walt Whitman with a very lovely inscription of greeting me as a fellow American, oh. you know, <laughs> things of that yeah, sort. Yeah. And during World War II, Robert actually was in the service yes. for America. <laughs> yes, I should say for America. Yes, yes he was drafted in '43, was sent abroad in summer '44. And uh, his group was in the Battle of the Bulge. So there were some, some moments which were not quite comfortable. Yes, 